We hope that you're having uh, an enjoyable experience, and it's one of my favorite things that I can do today as an experience is to introduce Kathy Singer, because she's somebody that many of us admire, in particular myself, as an icon here in the park. She is a woman who has done an amazing job leading a business, data sciences, motivating people, teaching us how to be better managers, and just a quiet force that has allowed us to have a major employment impact on our community. So Kathy Singer is going to be our, our lunchtime speaker today, and she's currently the VP of Engineering for Data at Oath. She thought it may be important that we explain what Oath is, which I think she's going to do in her talk. For those of you who walk by their building, you see the Yahoo brand, and many of us still refer to that this is Yahoo. Yahoo, the largest employer here in the research park. And that's true, except for really Yahoo is a part of Oath. So Yahoo being a consumer brand, Oath being combined assets that were purchased and put together by Verizon as the parent company. So in whatever context you want to think of Kathy, Yahoo, Oath, Verizon, she's impressive in any of those fronts and all the different roles that she's had in her career. She manages, as in her VP role, all of data engineering across, across the Oath assets, and she'll describe some of those for you and the different businesses that are a part of Oath. But she is also the highest ranking female engineer in all of Oath. And if you know of all the divisions that are part of that, that's a really impressive feat. And uh, we're really glad that she continues to be elevated within the company and elevate her team here to achieve new successes now that it's part of Verizon as well. So please join me in giving a round welcome of applause and welcome to Kathy Singer. Thank you all, it's great to be here today. I'm gonna to start by unlocking my laptop. <laughs> okay, so today's topic, I'm gonna to talk about building a big data rainforest. You probably haven't heard the term building a big data rainforest before because I just made it up. And um, my goal is that for years to come, you guys will talk about I'm building a big data rainforest. So um, only 6% of the entire planet has tropical rainforests. Yet, over 50% of all life on this planet comes from the rainforest. It has vast amount of biodiversity, and the rate of new life is greater than any other place on the planet, only matched by our coral reefs. So they have this really special ecosystem where uh, much of the life there depends on other life there and could not flourish in isolation but they have this symbiotic relationship with the environment. And I'm gonna to talk today about having that same kind of symbiotic relationship in, for a big data ecosystem. And that includes the talent, the technology, and the strategy. So my uh, building, uh, the Oath Yahoo Verizon building is um, just south of here on uh, the same block, and we have about 200 um, engineers and data scientists working there. Our um, charter is providing lightning fast data that you can trust. And by data, I mean raw data, and I mean data insights and data science. And trust means trusting that all the data is complete, that it's accurate, and that it will be there when you need it to be. So first I'm going to start by explaining how data is so important at Oak. So what we do, we have a ton of media properties. You probably can relate to some of them. Uh, Tumblr, Yahoo Mail, Yahoo Sports, Yahoo Finance, um, Huffington Post, TechCrunch, 
and many more. These, these are all those properties. And a lot of how we make money is that we, um, we have this great content for people to interact with. And then we also show ads. And um, every time we show an ad to someone, that's an impression, that's a piece of data. And for us, that data is revenue. We basically, we each of these little pennies add up to be billions of dollars of revenue for us. And um, we use our data for a lot of different things. We use it for personalization. Um, personalization is when um, we serve you a news article that you would be more interested in. Or serving you an ad about a bicycle because you love to bike. That's personalization. Um, we use it for reporting. Our reporting could be fraud detection is the kind of report to see what kind of uh, fraud is it trying to get into our system. Um, understanding uh, corporate metrics. We provide reports that our CEO looks at every single morning. That's reporting. Finance, financials, um, we run the source of truth for both our billing of our customers and also accounting. And finally, insights. Insights can, um, deep insights can include, okay, uh, Yahoo Sports changed the look of their page, and we want to know in 10 minutes whether, or maybe five, we're losing people because they don't like the new look. So, um, so some of these need to be very quick turnaround, and some of them will be, how is this campaign doing? Maybe this, um, are they reaching their target audience, for example? So, we do things at scale, massive scale. So every day we take 1.6 petabytes of data and bring it from all over the world onto our systems. And when you think about um, what is a petabyte of data, well, the largest um, a digital library is the Digital Library of Congress. And that's roughly equivalent to 1.6 petabytes. So every single day, we're moving from all over the world the Digital Library of Congress onto our systems. And that includes 300 billion events. An event is anything we want to know about. Did someone click on an ad? Did someone see an ad? Did someone see a news article in Huffington Post? Every single thing like that is considered an event. And then finally, data producers. Our data producers go from, for example, uh, Yahoo Sports is the data producer, or uh, Huffington Post, Tumblr, those are all data producers, as well as our ad platforms are data producers. Um, so, this is the outline of my talk. I have three main sections. The team, this is all about the people, making a great team. The technology and the architecture strategy, and then finally, what does it mean to put this all together to, to run a successful data organization? <laughs> so here's the team. Um, uh, we're here at the Illini Stadium in this picture. We are seen as a gem throughout our company. Uh, we, have, we have more patents percentile relative to much other, uh, much larger groups in the company. We have, um, we're, we're trusted with the revenue source of truth, which is, you can think of as the most important part of, of what a company does. And um, we have um, many uh, committers to open source that are externally recognized. But we didn't start this way. Actually, um, well, before I go to the next slide, um, who thinks lemons? grow in the rainforest. Raise your hand if you think lemons grow in a rainforest. We have one correct person right there. <laughs> lemons grow in the rainforest. What is your name? Sophia. Sophia, you're amazing. Okay, so, uh, so, so lemons do grow in the rainforest. And uh, we started out with lemons. We were part of um, of Motorola and Motorola's cell phone business. No one wanted a razor phone anymore. They started closing offices and they closed our office. And um, we were people who worked on things like Bluetooth stacks when it was an emerging technology. 
we uh, worked on operating systems, and um, we decided we really wanted to stay together. So we marketed it ourselves to several companies in Silicon Valley. I was uh, lucky to be able to give the presentation to them. And um, uh, it turned out two companies came, Yahoo came and Qualcomm came. And um, Qualcomm was doing something that was almost exactly the same to what we were doing before. And uh, Yahoo was doing something we knew absolutely nothing about. No one knew about the internet, no one knew about big data. And many of the engineers ended up with a choice, where to go. And some chose Qualcomm to keep building on their expertise. But a bunch of people said, I want to do something completely different I know nothing about. And um, that was the foundation of the Yahoo team. So it was founded in people who love to learn and aren't afraid of change. So that was our beginning. And the talent is the most important thing of your organization. And if you know a tree, you, uh, the amount of roots that are underground is pretty much equivalent to what's above the ground. But you don't see the roots, they're invisible. And they're not the fruit of the tree, they're just the roots. But without those roots, that tree is just gonna fall over. Well, it's the same thing in the rainforest as in the big data rainforest. It's all about the talent and making sure you grow your talent, invest in your talent, and you start with good talent too um, to make a successful rainforest. So what makes a high performance team? When I think about a high performance team, the number one thing I think about are people who respect each other and they love to bring their ideas to the table. They're not afraid to have different opinions. They have diverse skills, diverse opinions, and they're really generous with giving credit. When I meet with my team members and I say, great job on this, they're always say, the first thing they always say is, well, I can't take credit. It was really this person and this person and I couldn't have done it without this person. So just super generous with giving credit. Um, and, um, and they know that it's not, like sometimes people have one really smart person on the team and they all want to get information from them, but a high performance team realizes that everyone needs to use their brain and no matter how smart that one person is, it's not going to be as powerful as having a whole team using their brain. And the most important thing is when you see a, a high performance team, you see a team where everyone's just putting the team success in front of their own success. Now, I have another question. Who thinks that apples grow in the rainforest? Raise your hand. <laughs> we have one great soul. Apples do not grow in the rainforest. Alright, so, so, um, and especially not bad apples. Now, what is a bad apple? A bad apple is something, um, is someone who makes other people not want to express their ideas, or maybe not come to work. A bad apple is not someone who's maybe just doesn't code quite as fast as their peers. That's not a bad apple. And um, a bad apple is also should never be considered someone who has a different opinion. People who have different opinions, a minority opinion, those are amazing and you need to take care of those people. But a bad apple is someone who just makes other people not want to express their ideas. If you have one, just get rid of them as soon as possible. <laughs> Uh, next, what makes a leader in the rainforest? Um, I think the number one thing a leader needs to do is they need to listen and understand and look for the strengths that their people have and then give those people, empower them to run with those strengths. And they're, they're also somebody who, when things go wrong, they say, yep, it's totally my fault. And when things go right, they step aside and they, they point to their team. Um, that's a good leader, and uh, roadblocks, they need to remove them, but even more important than a leader removing the roadblocks 
is empowering the people on their team to remove their own roadblocks. So, what does it take to hire in the rainforest? A lot, a lot of work. So, um, this means you know, going out to, I personally go out to career fairs, I get this really long line of people, and it's a lot of work to talk to the candidates. But there are things you, do, you can do to make it a little easier. Um, we do phone interviews first, find out which candidates we want to bring in. Once they pass that phone interview, now we're going to make a big investment. We're going to have them there the whole day. And the people we're going to pick to do the interview are going to be our best people. And, and a lot of people feel like, oh, you don't want to waste your best people's time. But this is the most important thing you do. So you need to have your best people doing those interviews. And have the people interviewing be in the same role as the person you're interviewing for. So maybe it's a level up. And also throw in some adjacent roles as well. But make sure you don't have a bunch of managers interview an engineer. You should have an engineer interview the engineer. So that was the end of the talent piece of this talk. Now I'm going to talk about the uh, tech strategy. I'm going to start with this is our end-to-end -end data flow. So in the very uh, beginning, this is our data producer. For this case, we'll say Huffington Post. Then the data comes through our data highway. Remember we talked about the 1.6 petabytes? That's what's traveling through data highway into our pipelines. This is where we do things like transform, clean, join, and aggregate the data. And finally, it goes to our downstream systems, billing, reporting, whether we're doing targeting, that's all happens here. But I now want you to focus on that big box, the data pipeline box, because it's actually not that simple. I just replaced it with three boxes, and um, they're, they're, we actually do batch pipelines. That's for um, very accurate data and maybe runs on like 15 minute SLA. And then we feed a data lake. Um, we also have the streaming. The streaming is very important because sometimes you have to know within seconds or less than a second. For example, if someone's budget is running out, you need to know that immediately. Or there's fraud, you want to know that immediately. So, um, so those are seconds. So that data is not quite as accurate as the batch data, which is a little slower but more accurate. And then you see this data lake. Uh, we call ours NEST, um, and, but it's a data lake, and we bring all the data from the data pipelines. When we started, we had 40 people building one data pipeline. Um, then we moved to two-bit data pipelines, three data pipelines, and it took us about a year to build that first data pipeline. But then we started reusing our frameworks. And little by little, we went, we were, I remember we were so excited. We had built a data pipeline in six months with 10 people. And that was a huge achievement. And then we did one in a quarter with about 10 people. Now we can build a data pipeline with about three people in about three weeks. So that's where we are right now and we run 20 different pipelines. So, but this data lake box, before we had it, this is what our system looked like. Each time we had a new business, we built a pipeline and it would run to all the downstream consumers. So everyone had to talk to the billing team, everyone had to talk to the researchers, everyone had to talk to the corporate metrics team, and it was a mess and it took a lot of work. But after we came up with the concept of our data lake called NAS, which we um, normalize the data, we clean it up, and we prepare it all in ways that it can easily be used by the downstream customers. And this solves problems like a lot of these businesses, sometimes Yahoo like to buy new companies all the time, like we bought Tumblr, for example, at some point. And um, you, you need the 
data to um, everyone might call location something different. They might call time, might be Pacific time, East Coast time, UTC time. Um, you need one place where you normalize it so people can go across all the businesses and, um, and feed those downstream consumers. So this is what it looks like um, when you have multiple pipelines. Each of those rivers, those are internal names, so don't worry too much about the names, but um, those are to each different businesses. They, we have common software, like traffic protection, for example. When we find fraud on one of our businesses, we quickly use machine learning to go across all of our businesses and catch that same fraud. And then that feeds into, and, and we do other things as well, common software like conversion <coughs> attribution. We'll go across all of them to decide which business gets credit for a purchase. It feeds in, and then everyone can consume that data. So making the data easy for the people within the company who need it is really important if you want to have a successful uh, data science, data insights. Um, it's not good enough just to hire a data science and expect them to do their job unless you built up this kind of infrastructure. So, no talk without data is complete without security. And we, it's very important when you do a project, from the very beginning, we design in security. And data, we encrypt. Um, whenever it's going from one place to another place. Um, we make sure we're GDPR compliant. That's the European standard of users being able to control their data. And um, we anonymize our data. That means we remove everything so that it can actually be traced back to a real person. So, for example, we never want to have someone's birthday um, in our data. This is a little bit of a close-up of what I was showing you before of the data pipeline. So you can see all the way to the right is where the data highway would be, all the way to the left would be where the lake is. But in the middle, you see where we're using um, uh, the batch pipeline is the big purple tube, and that is where um, we're using Hadoop, and it has more of the 15-minute la latency. Below is where we're using getting the immediate streaming data using Storm. We also use other technologies like Druid, um, which allows us to do um, very fast queries on large amounts of data. One of the things we take advantage of is open source. We are very active in the open source community. Yahoo actually was the um, beginners of the Duke. Um, we use Hadoop a lot, as well as Hive and Spark for processing. Uh, as I mentioned before, we use Storm and um, Apache HBase. Uh, the interesting thing about all of these things is we don't just take open source, but we become committers, we give back, um, we make changes, we become part of the open source community, which allows us to move much faster. And um, we also have donated many open source um, <laughs> technologies back. And um, Eli, Philly, and Navi are all right here, done, authored in Champaign. We started open source communities for each one of them. We also are big drivers of Druid as well. And um, so we have two, I think the two things we use to be, to do a lot with not many people is common frameworks, common software internally, and then we leverage the community and work with the open source technologies. Now the final part of my talk is putting it all together. So I don't know if any of you are familiar with the layers of the rainforest, but the very top is the emergent layer. That's where the eagles, the hawks, there's a few trees that are taller than all the other trees. But then there's the canopy layer. And the canopy layer is very thick and blocks out 95% of the sunlight 
from all the layers beneath it. And that's where most of the food is, most of the animals hang out and live in the canopy layer. And then we have the understory layer. Um, you might see um, frogs and, and snakes and the forest floor, which is pitch dark, and it's where you see the top of the roots. And um, what is important here is that all the fruit, is, it's all at the top, but it's the bottom layers that sustain the rainforest. And it's very similar. Um, this is a modified data ML pyramid. And um, the bottom layer, and it actually corresponds to our building, we have a team on the first floor, and they do uh, the grid infrastructure. They do Hadoop and Storm, and um, they keep that um, all those tools um, available for everyone else in the grid. Then on top of that, on the next floor in Champaign, we have a team that does the data system, um, and they're building those pipelines, so allowing the data to flow from end to end. And on top of that, we now have also moved into advanced analytics, and um, where we're taking that data and making it very visual for people to be able to see whether it's outliers or trends. And then finally, machine learning. And that's, um, we have many examples of machine learning, but things like, I love the fraud one, that's my favorite, I guess, where we're, there's people whose full-time job is to do fraud on the internet. So we have people whose full-time job is to come up with machine learning to catch that fraud. And um, we have several other groups doing machine learning as well. And so it's um, very important you get that bot base right so that you can then move up. So our strategy for my team is, number one, people are first. Grow your talent and use the collective genius of all the people on your team. Next, build scalable systems. Don't do hacks. You know, build something that's going to work at a massive scale because we have to work at a massive scale. The, the data, when we have a CEO who looks at our data every single morning, first thing they come in, her and her team, it's got to be there, you know, when she looks at it. And, and that's from the night before. Um, growing large data uh, scope, we keep growing. We started out with one business in Yahoo, then we grew to all of Yahoo. When we merged with AOL, which brought in things like HuffPost and TechCrunch, we expanded our scope, and then um, now we're um, leveraging our skills for Verizon and our systems for Verizon. And they also have massive data. So we are we continue to grow our data scope, and that allows us to do better analytics and more advanced machine learning, which brings us enables us to enter new business spaces. We're coming up with new uh, ideas all the time because of our good use of data and making impactful innovations. So the goal is to unlock the value of this massive data. So this is a slide I actually used internally to justify my team's existence. And um, the only thing that's different is I actually have big revenue numbers under that monkey. So, um, but I wasn't allowed to share them, so I just put a monkey there. And um, so basically the, the power of unified data, you get revenue from it, and you get new business ideas. The power of having a unified data team um, is you prevent each team from reinventing the wheel, you leverage this ex expertise, you can become industry experts. And leveraging cross data, that's when you do things like you can look across all of the data and get insights that you would never see if you could only see um, a one angle of it. Um, my favorite example, which I didn't come up with, but is they used to think apple pie, the best apple pie was, um, I mean, the best, po most popular pie was apple pie because that was the one that sold the best 
in supermarkets. They, they only sold big pies at that point. And then at some point, they decided to sell little pies. And they found out apples wasn't no longer the best selling pie. Instead, um, it turned out the apple pie was just everybody's second favorite. And if you're buying a big pie for the whole family, um, you'll buy an apple pie. But if you can buy a little pie, um, and they, could, they never knew that apple pie really wasn't everyone's favorite pie until they could get that additional data by selling the little pies. So, um, so, so that's why it's so important to bring your data together and make it consumable across. So this is it. This is um, uh, bringing it all together, what you need for your big data rainforest. Invest in a strong foundation. Leverage common frameworks and open source. Democratize data for your whole company. Of course, using governments. So only people who should have the data can get the data. And finally, um, having a collaborative and innovative team culture. <laughs> so this is it. Once you do all those things, you can reap the awards of the rainforest. Who thinks flamingos are in the rainforest? Raise your hand. <laughs> All right, we have a few people. They like to live at the edge of rainforests. So they're kind of, they're not in the deep, but they're right there at the edge of the rainforest. Finally, questions. What is the favorite part? <laughs> We invented Hadoop, 
you know, and so um, we don't need a, a cloud <laughs> error, but it, um, but I think that for smaller companies, as um, she asked, I think that's totally a very, um, if you need an open source provider, you can definitely, if you don't have the skills in house, that's a very logical thing to do. I'll give you a uh, we have, um, so in Champaign, we have 200 people. Um, I also have teams in California and in um, Dulles. Yes? Um, among the different components of the rainforest, which one is the most difficult, most challenging to build? That's a really good question. Um, I, I would say um, that the challenging part is um, when you keep bringing in new businesses to get them to match your, to get them to become part of the rainforest. And part of that is a battle of people want to hold together. Let's say you're a little startup company and you get purchased by Yahoo, or oh, you, you want to hold your data close to you, and um, you're used to doing it one way, and we say, welcome to the rainforest, and you might want to hide under a tree. You know, and getting, and getting those, um, getting hold of that um, team to, to work with you and get involved in the rainforest, and every time they're so happy they did afterwards, but sometimes it takes some work to, um, and, and technical work too, because they're going to have a completely different um, vocabulary. Their data is going to be completely structured different. All of this is very structured data. And so when you bring in someone new, you need to get them to kind of match the same structure if you're really going to make use across. I think I'm out of time. <laughs> Stay there. <laughs> Stay there because I think she deserves a huge round of applause.